Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lesson on the geography of China. And our essential question for this lesson is going to be, how did geography affect ancient China? That will be a question that you write across the top. We know it as the EQ. It always goes across the top of your Cornell notes. And while you're writing that down, I will go ahead and pause this. But right now, I'm going to change the slide. Our first left side question for today's lesson is, how did natural barriers influence ancient China? Uh, you will write that question on the left, and the bullet points that you see you will write to the right side of the line in your notes. Please note the map of China at the bottom. First thing you need to know is that China was surrounded by four important natural barriers. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of review it's here. 10 o'clock. It is 10 o'clock. China was surrounded by four important natural barriers. These barriers um, were extremely important in understanding how geography affected China. The first of these barriers was the Pacific Ocean, which is the largest body of water on the face of the earth. And more importantly, because it's so large, it makes it very difficult for people on the other side of that ocean to get to China. Second natural barrier is the Gobi Desert on the north side of China. The Gobi Desert is right here. Uh, the Gobi Desert uh, was important because even though it was flat, it's very hard to get across a desert. And because it's very hard to get across a desert, it's very hard to invade China from across the desert due to the lack of food and water for an invading army. The next natural barrier was the Himalayan mountains, which just happened to be the largest mountain range on the face of the earth. Uh, the Himalayan mountains were virtually impossible for anybody to cross back in those days. Uh, these days we pretty much use airplanes to do it. Um, but you really have to be very serious about trying to get into China by crossing the Himalayas. Otherwise, it's virtually impossible. And the final barrier was the Tibetan Plateau, which happens to be the highest plateau on the face of the Earth. If you have my geography class, you know that a plateau is a flat area of land at a very high elevation. Flat and high elevation and the, Tib the Tibetan Plateau. So basically, once you got over the Himalayas, if you were lucky enough to get across the Himalayas, then you were on the Tibetan Plateau, and you had to get across that. So you really had to want to get into China to get into China. What effect did this have? Uh, these barriers basically made it hard for China to be invaded from the outside of the country. Um, they protected China from invasion, which does not mean that China has never been invaded. It just means that it was very, very hard to invade China. You had to know what you were doing and you had to be very efficient about doing it. Also, these barriers kept China isolated from the rest of the world. Um, China was sealed off from the rest of the world um, because these barriers prevented outsiders um, from getting into China, um, which was both good and bad. Um, the isolation made it so that trade was very, very difficult. If you wanted to trade with China, you had to go to great effort to do it. And more importantly, it made cultural exchange difficult. So Chinese culture was pretty much insulated and protected from outside influence. But what that sometimes meant is that there were times where China was way ahead of the rest of the world, and there were other times where the rest of the world was way ahead of China. So that was kind of a two-way street. Uh, right now, I'm going to give you time to finish copying this down before I switch to the next slide. Our next left side question is, how did foreign contact affect China over time? You'll put that question on the left, and we're going to look at this through the lens of three different dynasties. The first of those dynasties is the Tang Dynasty, which existed from 618 to 907 in the Common Era. Common Era is the term we use. We do not use AD anymore. Common Era is the era that we all share in common. Um, during the Tang Dynasty, foreigners traveled to China over what was known as the Silk Road. 
um, and we're going to go into the Silk Road in a lot more detail in a future lesson, but this is a picture of the Silk Road. And if you notice, it's fairly long and it goes through quite a few geographic features and you really have to want to travel it to go along it because it's super long. Uh, the Tang Dynasty took control over much of the route of the Silk Road, which made it for safe uh, trade and travel. So if you wanted to go into China, if the route you're taking uh, doesn't have a lot of security along it, it's going to be a pretty dangerous situation. You want someone providing uh, police and military control over it to make your path safe. So this area right here was pretty much controlled by the Tang to help keep that route safe. Uh, Buddhism came into China from India during the Tang period. Buddhism started in India. Um, some people consider Buddhism a religion. Other people consider Buddhism to be a philosophy. Uh, the most important thing for you to know is it came into China during the Tang dynasty. Uh, and at first, the Chinese welcomed this belief system and many Chinese converted to Buddhism. Um, but over time, um, the Tang, during the Tang Dynasty, the Chinese started to become fearful of outsiders and Buddhism represented outsiders. And they also saw Buddhists as being very, very wealthy and the Tang Dynasty wanted to get some of that money. So they started going after them. And so Buddhists started to get oppressed towards the end of the Tang Dynasty because they were seen as outsiders. And nations and empires that become insecure with themselves often tend to start to become fearful of others and people from the outside um, when they are feeling insecure about their own selves. And uh, that is a pattern that exists throughout history and throughout time. And with that, we're going to switch to the next dynasty. We're going to keep the same left side question in this case, but we're going to start talking about the Mongol Empire, specifically the Mongol dynasty in China, which lasted from 1279 to 1379 in the Common Era. Uh, the Mongols dominated China, but as you can see from the map, they also dominated most of Asia and became one of the largest, if not the largest empire the world has ever seen. Um, the Mongols themselves were not Chinese. They were from Mongolia. They invaded China from the north. We're also going to be learning about that in a fairly high level of detail um, in the not-too-distant future. The Mongols ended up controlling much of Asia, and because they had that control, it made it safe for travel and trade. And since the Mongols were outsiders themselves, they were not necessarily fearful of outsiders. They pretty much felt they could defeat anybody they wanted to because they pretty much had. So they established a maritime trade in addition to trading over the Silk Road. So notice maritime is a vocabulary word. So they built a fleet of ships and started trading with the rest of the world using boats and not just traveling over the Silk Road. Um, they also came to China and helped them set up an observatory. So Persians uh, come from what we now know as Iran. So when you hear Iran, think Persians because that's the ethnic group that lives there. And before it was called Iran, it was called Persia. Uh, they came to China and helped them set up observatories. They brought them the technology needed to um, create telescopes. Uh, that came from the outside. And also during this time, a rather famous guy named Marco Polo used to travel back and forth from Italy into China. Uh, the Mongol leaders in China uh, gave him a very high status within China. And when he went back to Europe to tell stories about China, those stories would spread. So much so that eventually a guy named Christopher Columbus wanted to find a faster route to get to China. And I think we know what happened there. So... About to move on to the final slide. Same left side question. Now we're going to talk about the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty existed from 1368 to 1644 CE. Got to fix that, Mr. B. 
Uh, the Ming were very arrogant, and they made the surrounding nations pay them tribute. And here's a word for you, kowtow to the emperor. So the Ming would literally go to the surrounding countries, force their leaders to come to Beijing, the capital of China, bow to the emperor, and pay him money just for the privilege of trading with China. And because China was so powerful, it could get away with behaving like that. Um, a country that pays tribute is called a tributary. So that makes that a multiple meaning word because if you have my geography class, you'd know that tributary is a smaller river that empties into a larger river. In this case, it's a smaller country that empties its money into the larger country. Um, the larger country in this case being China, the Chinese empire. Under the Ming Dynasty, a gentleman by the name of Zhang He was sent around the world with 300 ships and 27,000 men to show the world just how powerful China was and encourage the rest of the world to trade and pay tribute to China. Um, he did this seven different times. In fact, it is believed that on one of these journeys, uh, he may have even reached the west coast of North America read California, Oregon, Washington, well before a guy named Christopher Columbus uh, did the same thing. There is evidence to suggest that the Chinese actually quote unquote discovered America before Christopher Columbus did. That's an interesting thing for you to think about. But in any case, this gentleman sailed around the world seven times to show the world how powerful China was, how impressive China was, and to basically shake the rest of the world down for money and to encourage the rest of the world to trade with China. However, after Zheng He died in 1434 CE, uh, China once again turned inward, stopped wanting to trade with the rest of the world, stopped wanting to share ideas with the rest of the world, and it became very isolated. And as a result of that isolation, after the Ming Dynasty fell in 1644, China became very weak, and during that same time, Europe was experiencing the Renaissance where it was improving its technology, it was starting to explore the world, and by the time Europe encountered China again, Europe was very, very powerful, China was very, very weak, and the Europeans uh, exploited that and basically carved up China into various fiefdoms that the Europeans controlled until after World War II, when the Communist Revolution in China in 1949 finally once again unified China under one central government, which it still is today. So the China of today is essentially trying to regain the status and power of the China of ancient times. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something that is going to play out over the course of your lifetimes. Stay tuned. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for you to write a summary at the bottom of your notes. You should have a summary statement about the geography of China and the influence it had on keeping China isolated. You should have a summary statement about the Tang Dynasty. You should have a summary statement about the Mongol Dynasty. And you should have a summary statement about the Ming Dynasty. I will invite you to share those summaries with your table partners as well as with the class very soon, either today or the next time we have class. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is once again Mr. Blumendahl signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.